Well, we're in the life of Elisha, and today we're going to talk about seeing the invisible. And uh, you may know that Beverly's on vacation, so my background and my PowerPoint is a little bit more masculine today than sometimes, and that's okay. That's good. Um, a, a great quote from the uh, really well-known, world-famous philosopher Yogi Berra once said, you can observe a lot by seeing. Yeah, that's brilliant, isn't it? So, um, and it is true. Sometimes we need to just look around and see things, but uh, a lot of people today don't see. They just don't see. Now, some of you, because you have been energized by God's Holy Spirit, you can go outside and look at a tree or a leaf or, uh, or see a cloud or, or look at a star in the sky, and you can say, it is unbelievable the orderliness of this creation. Truly, there is an intelligent designer who has made all things. You can see that. Or some other person who's not energized by God's spirit can look at that and say, boy, what a chaotic world this is. And it just came together by chance. And uh, there's surely nothing behind this. It's just we're all floating in our, in our own different ways. Some people see it. Some people don't. And uh, there, are, there are many, many things that can be seen if you just look and observe, but some people don't have that mindset. There are some people who are really, really brilliant because they can see things one, two, three steps ahead of everybody else. In the sports world, we often talk about you know, anticipating what's going to happen next, and sometimes the better athletes are the ones who know what's going to happen, where that ball is going to go next, or how it's going to play out. Uh, or maybe in the business world, the person who can say, I know what the economy is going to, and I can make my decision based on what is best uh, economically. And there's a lot like that. And in the spiritual world, it's really, really helpful to be able to anticipate and know and to see ahead of what's going on. We're in um, 2 Kings chapter 6. And I'm not going to cover the first seven verses, but, uh, you know, there, in my world, I often sit down and try to plan, what are we going to study? What do I want to communicate to the congregation? Uh, and I often tell myself that, you know, I'm going to be here a long time, so I don't have to tell you everything in the first day. But now, after a long time, I keep saying, you know, there's so many great things that we just don't cover. The first seven verses here are going to be one of those. So for all you outdoorsmen, uh, I just thought I will at least mention to you this very strange addition to the story. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I think this is in here because God is wanting everybody to know that Elisha is his man. He's putting his stamp of approval on him. And, um, you know, there's a lot of miracles that God had done through Elisha. Uh, we've looked at most of these, but... Uh, so far in, in the history up into chapter 6, uh, was, Elisha was part of parting the Jordan River. Uh, he made the, the spring of water around Jericho drinkable. Uh, he sent bears out of, the, out of the wilderness to punish some, uh, some disobedient people. Uh, he saw the, the ditches that they dug out in the desert flooded with water. He multiplied, we didn't look at this, but he multiplied the widow's uh, supply of oil. He also, uh, the Shunammite woman's um, son was resurrected uh, and also helped a, a woman to, who was barren to bear a son. Uh, he purified a poison stew in chapter 4. Last week we looked at the fact that he healed Naaman of leprosy and then Gehazi was struck with leprosy because of his sinfulness and then here we are in these first seven verses and there um, there was there was this company of prophets that existed studying God's word trying to be faithful to God and they were growing under the ministry of Elisha they were growing and they needed more um more living space. They needed more accommodations. And so they decided they were going to go up the river and they were going to chop down some trees. And they invited Elisha to come. They were going to chop trees, send it down the river, build a, a bigger dormitory. And uh, everything was going to be good. But while they were up there, one of the prophets was using a, an axe and 
the uh, axe head flew off the handle and went out into the water, into the deep part of the water and sunk. It's an iron axe head. What do you expect it to do? It sunk. And, um, and it became upsetting, I would say, mostly because this prophet who was doing this was an extremely conscientious person. It was a borrowed axe. Now, I don't know what their world was like back then. Um, today, you, you mess up your axe, you put a new, you get a new axe, or you put it. But apparently, this was something very, very serious to this gentleman. And Elisha happened to be there. So he broke off some, I would imagine, some kind of a twig or branch, and he reached it out into the water, and he put it near or maybe even was able to reach and touch this axe head, and all of a sudden this metal iron axe head that was on the bottom of the, of the water floated up to the top and flowed into the shore so that this guy could get it and put it back. That's it. That's the story. <laughs> And, and you can say, well, what in the world was that in there for? Uh, I'm going to say, I don't know. But I would say maybe it's another time God's just showing his approval of Elijah. Maybe he's also just trying to show them that he provides for Israel, that he has care and compassion for them. And, and maybe just for the individual, that he wanted him to know that, that he cared for him. Psalm 55, verse 22 tells us that we can cast our cares on God because he cares for us. Peter repeated that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Again, cast your burdens and your cares on God because he cares for you. He cares about the borrowed axe head that fell in the water. You know, He cares about minutia that many people will say, God doesn't care about that. Surely he, he could care less who does this or who does that or how that happens. And somehow in his um, omniscience, he does care and he understands. And all those details, everything all works together according to God's great and wonderful plans. And he does care. So that's, uh, that's for all you guys who care about axe heads and things like that, uh, those first seven verses. Now we're going to come to a conflict that takes place between those two nations, Syria and Israel. And in verses 8 through 10, I'll read it to you a little bit about the conflict. Now the king of Aram, which is Syria, was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the are uh, Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king of Israel so that he was on his guard in such places. The king of Syria or Aram was a man named Ben-Hadad. And here he was, he's planning several raids. It's like, we're going to get those people of Israel. We're going to attack them. We're going to go here and attack them. We'll go there and, and hit them at this place. And every single time he prepared his armament to go down and, and to, to fight them and to attack Israel, somehow they were right there waiting and defending themselves every single time. That had to be very, very frustrating to him. This conflict between the two nations brings up to me lots of questions. Now, as you read through this, I'm sure you have some of the questions I have. There are some pretty tough ones here. Um, for instance, who is leaking information? This is military high classified stuff, and somehow Israel seems to know every single thing that Syria is going to do. They go up north a little bit, here's a defensive wall. They go down to the south a little bit, there's Israel, ready to defend themselves. Every single time, no matter what the skirmish, no matter what uh, raid that, that Syria planned, Israel was always ready for that. Now that's, um, that's not something that unusual. Uh, today we have lots of military leaks. I saw this week on the AOL thing where they tell you all the different news stories that apparently there's some new movie coming out about the death of uh, Osama bin Laden. And our highest forms of government are 
irate about the fact that there's some classified information that's a part of the movie, that somehow they got this information uh, as to how we, we did all this stuff. Uh, it's not an old thing, it's not a new thing, it, it happens, and, and it's a very significant thing. But here's what was going on. Elisha supernaturally received valuable military information from the Lord. That's what was going on. Now, it's going to be suggested here that anything that King Ben-Hadad said, even in the privacy of his bedroom, that somehow Israel knew about this. I assure you, Elisha was not hiding in the closet. <laughs> that's one possibility, but that's not what it was. This was stuff that God was making known to him. When we go into, uh, so now the king ben Hadad is going to throw a internal investigation. we got to figure out what's going on here. Verses 11 and 12. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? Who's the traitor? Who in here is giving away this secret information? Verse 12, None of us, my lord, the king. Uh, None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. No one here is giving up inside information. It's Elisha that's doing all this stuff. Elisha's the one giving it away. How did they know about Elisha? This is Syria. It's not Israel. How do they know about this guy, who he is, and, and what he's doing? Um, the answer to that that I have is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how they knew about this. Um, very interesting stuff. Who, who was it that was um, the officer telling all this? You know, who is this guy? What, what is his position? What is he, um, how is it that he's giving away this information? We don't know that either. Was he a believer? Is it possible that he's on the outside and, and looking in and saying, you know, the God of Israel is the one true God, and, um, and maybe I ought to know about this God, and maybe he's learned from people, and, and maybe he understands that uh, this is the way it goes. I, I found it interesting, the idea that the privacy of the bedroom, the conversation there, um, in, in our world today, you know this, um, the social networking stuff, the Twitters and the, the Facebooks and all that kind of stuff is so explosive and things are happening. A couple weeks ago, Mike and Mike in the morning, ESPN uh, talk, sports talk thing, they were just going crazy over the fact that a football player at the University of Southern California was at a party and apparently was maybe, um, slightly under the influence, and for fun, someone asked him, hey, do you, will, will, who will pay you more, the University of Southern Cal to play football or the National Football League to play football? And everybody chuckled, and he said, oh, USC pays more. Very, very funny, except for someone sitting there with a phone, and they videotaped it all, and it gets out in the world, and, and everybody knows, and now that football player's been suspended by the University of Southern Cal. Mike and Mike are going crazy over this whole thing of, you know, the mass communication. Anything you do gets out there. And their whole thing was he had six seconds of a discrepancy that he, he should have, he was uh, indiscreet for those six seconds, and it's costing him big time. You know, the thing I like about all this is God even knows everything about those six seconds, too. It's not like you get a six-second leeway where once in a while you can get away with something for six seconds and nobody knows about it. God knows it all. God is a part of it all. And, uh, and we will stand before God for all of it. Well, somehow they knew. Elisha knew even the conversations, at least about the military stuff. 
and there's this officer saying, I'll bet it's Elisha. I'll bet it's that prophet of God that God is revealing stuff to him, and he's the one uh, telling the king uh, Jehoram of Israel. Why would Elijah even help the wicked king? Remember back in chapter 3, verse 14, when he said, you know, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, who I respect, I wouldn't even give you the time of the day. I wouldn't even spit in your face. You're not worth it to me. And yet now, here he is, he's feeding him information to help him. Well, I think it's because he understood the ramifications for Israel. He cared about Israel more than he did Jehoram. And I think also maybe he's taking the viewpoint that uh, King David did when he would come upon King Saul. And he said, you know, I can't do this. This is God's anointed. I may not like this guy. He may be a horrible, wicked king misleading us in every way imaginable spiritually with eternal ramifications to it. But he's still the guy God put on the throne, and I need to respect what God does. Well, anyhow, the king of... Um, of Syria, Ben-Hadad, decides it's time to send out the special ops. So in verse 13 and 14, he says, go out, fi find, go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. And a report came back, he's in Dotham. So then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. Wow. He's in Dothan. That's interesting. The king ordered that his men would go out and search and find him with the purpose of capturing Elisha. And I'm going to assume, I don't know this, that possibly he's going to be executed. I would think so. You're giving away military secrets. Sounds like a capital crime to me. And where do they find out? They, they decide, you know where he's at? He's in Dothan. Dothan, of all places. Dothan is just a small, tiny little settlement. It's 12 miles north of Samaria, which happened to be, at that time, the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom. They were, um, so he's 12 miles north of there in this tiny little town, had no defenses. Archaeologists tell us now that the only thing they see that is sort of like some form of defense is a retaining wall part of a retaining wall. It doesn't even go around the whole city. It's just a small little wall. Uh, they were absolutely unprepared for a military attack in this town. Why would Elisha pick Dothan? Well, it turns out that in Dothan, there were some Jewish Israelites that were living there. Not a whole lot, but this was a group of people who were very, very faithful to Jehovah God they never bowed their knee to Baal. Remember, um, Jehoram was trying to get everybody in Israel to worship Baal, and, and a lot of people were doing that. And here's this little settlement, of a handful of people saying, That's, this is just wrong. We're going to live for God. We're going to, the one true God, Israel's God, that's who we're going to serve. And, and they stayed very faithful there, and the rest of the world seemed to be untouched by them and did not touch them. It makes sense that Elisha would wander up there and want to be with them and, and find, you know, some companionship and, and find a peaceful existence there. So, so Elisha and his uh, servant go up there, and they're going to be there for a while. But here comes the military uh, of Syria, and they surround this little, little village of um, Dothan. But look what happens in verses 15 through 20. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning. Now, this is Elisha's servant. When he gets up and he goes out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. I'm just going to stop for a second, but isn't that amazing? Um, I, I wonder, how many times has that happened to you? You woke up and you're surrounded. <laughs> Probably not too often. I hope not. Some of you are military people. I was thinking more like the police have surrounded your house. You know, what did you do this time? But um, they wake up and, and, and the servant looks out there, and here's the Syrian army 
It's got them surrounded. They are absolutely surrounded. There's one little tiny retaining wall, no defense. You got a bunch of spiritual, godly people in the village, not very many. And, and here's an army out there with horses and chariots. And did you notice in, in verse 14, it, it called it a strong force, which just means that it was a huge amount of military people. They, they made sure that they were going to win this battle. They sent everybody in there. And what was Elisha's response? Eh, don't worry. No, we're okay. Don't worry about it. That's interesting. We need to know more as to why he said so he said don't be afraid those who are with us are more than those who are with them now if i were that servant i'd be like what (laughs) what are you saying we have some very peaceful people very spiritual godly people here it would be like if some military came and surrounded our church and i said to you that's okay we're more than they are and it's like, what? You know, look at who we are. You know, we're not, we're not really equipped to take on some national military right now. And um, that's what he was saying to him. There's more of us than there are of them. Somehow you got to, he's seeing something that the rest of us are not seeing. So don't be afraid. Verse 17, and Elisha prayed. Now, I'm hoping he's going to pray, God, send reinforcements. You know, fighter jets would be really nice. I know they're not invented yet, but boy, could we use some missile warfare here. Elijah prayed, oh, Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Now, I would have maybe said, Lord, give this guy really big muscles and and lots of spears to chuck at them and, and, you know, give him like an amazing fastball when he throws rocks because we need to defend ourselves. But then it says, the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills were alive, full of horses and chariots of fire. That'd be a good time to play that song. Uh, all around Elisha. They, they had all kinds of help, but it was spiritual help. It was angels and, and they were ready to, to defend amazing so um, the servant never saw that but elisha was aware that this was the case interesting what started out to be a very very peaceful morning turned into possibly one of the most horrifying moments of life and death that that servant ever would experience but elisha knew that um, even though they were surrounded by the troops of syria They were surrounded by much, much more than that. So they weren't going to fear. Elijah knew that God is an ever-present help in our time of need. Nothing's going to touch Elijah and his servant unless God permits it. Nothing comes into our lives unless God permits it. And if God permitted it, then it's God's will. And I don't want to be fatalistic in that. But even if it's something difficult, God's going to go through it with him. And even if it ends with the loss of life for Elisha and his servant, he would then be with God. And in his mind, this is all a win-win situation. There's a lot of verses in Scripture, and I'll just throw a couple things out, but it makes me think of 1 John 4, 4, when when we're told that, you know, in spiritual warfare, greater is he who's in us, which is the spirit of God for believers, than who's in the world, the spirit of Satan and and the Antichrist. God is greater and he's in us. He's on our side. In um, Romans chapter eight, it says, but if God is for us, who's gonna be against us? And it gives a whole list. There's eight more verses of everything you can imagine, visible, invisible, all kinds of things. And what can separate us from God's love when we are a part of God's family? Absolutely nothing. It's a win, 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 win situation for the follower of God. Just to throw out one of their kind of thoughts, in um, Psalm 68, it says, The chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands upon thousands. So go ahead, Syria. Bring your army Bring everything, throw everything you got at us. But God's got thousands and thousands and thousands of times 
more power than what you will ever, ever experience. So Elijah prayed again. This gets really fun. It says in verse 18, as the enemy came down toward him, Elijah prays to the Lord. You know, get what he prays. Strike these people with blindness. Hmm. Hadn't thought about that. That might need to be one of our pregame prayers when, when my team's playing. You know, Cloverleaf, Lord, just strike them with blindness, you know. Uh, I don't know if that would work, and that's probably pretty selfish. So he struck them with blindness, and Eli as Elijah had asked. Wow. That's an interesting thing. Now, the idea there for blindness, that, that word is only used one other time in, in the Old Testament. It's in Genesis 19.11. Uh, around the, the Sodom thing. And it literally means, I do believe it's a blindness. I do believe it's an eye uh, affliction. So I'm not saying that it's not true and literal, but it also, it conveys the idea that they were lost and had distorted vision, uh, resulting in a mental confusion. They were bewildered. They had no idea what was going on. It's like, I don't see where I'm going. Where am I going? What's going on here? And they're wandering and they're bumping into each other and, and, and they're having trouble. And all of a sudden, this, this strong force, in man's view, you know, this was a, a done deal. Syria was big and bad at this time and they had a strong force, a powerful thing. And now all of a sudden, they're confused and, and bewildered and they're bumping into each other. They have no clue what they're doing and uh, they're going to lose this one. I think it's interesting that Elijah prayed and his servant got clarity of vision. And then Elijah prays and the enemy lose their vision and lose their way along the way. Uh, very interesting to me. Donald Barnhouse makes an observation about spiritual warfare. I really wanted to bring this up. I, I know it's not good to read something from a book in public, but this is not real, real long. But here's his observations. Ordinarily, the human eye cannot see the spiritual forces that are arrayed in the invisible realm. The eye of faith can look into the word of God and know the truth of the power of the Lord we serve and can be sure then nothing can ever touch us unless it has passed through the will of God. We can be sure that though there may be wisdom on the other side, omniscience is on our side alone. We may be sure that though we find an enemy to be potent, we can find that our God alone is omnipotent. I think that's just a great reminder. No matter how strong, how big, how bad, the enemy is, our God is bigger, stronger, and tougher than any of them. So now, the Syrians are the ones who are surrounded. Nations can have armies, and kings can issue orders, but always God is in control. Always in control. So what does... Um, Elisha do next. This is really kind of fun, but this is really good. So in verse 19, Elisha told them, this is not the road. This is not the city. Follow me and I'll lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. And after they entered the city, Elijah said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. They went to Dothan to capture Elijah, and Elijah leads them to Samaria, which is the capital city of the kingdom of Israel, the tribes of Israel. They were just taken to the enemy capital. That would be frightening to them and horribly scary. Surely destruction is going to come upon them. That had to be the strangest procession, a bunch of blind military soldiers being led by a prophet of God, you know, in his sandals and his holding on to his staff and, and his servant probably bringing up the rear. And they're just going to march 12 miles right down to Samaria. And what were they thinking in Samaria? 
when the armies of Jehoram were standing there and it's like, what's this? Here comes the entire Syrian force, the strong force has surrendered to a prophet and they're walking into town here. There's no battle, there's no bloodshed, there's nothing. This is amazing. Hmm. The story goes on and you can read the other verses to say uh, you would, in some nations, that army would have been wiped out. Elisha advised Jehoram that don't do that. Don't do that. What you need to do is let's feed these people. They're hungry. Let's take care of them. Let's help them with their needs and let's send them back to their homeland. And then it goes on to tell us that um, you know, they didn't have too much trouble after this for a long time between the two nations. Very amazing. You know that God is with you even this very moment in this room. And if you're a follower of Christ and you're a believer in him and, and you're his disciple, whether you're in this room or out of this room or no matter where you're at, God is with you even at this moment. In fact, God could not be nearer to you even if you were in heaven. We don't see him, but that doesn't make it unreal. Even if you have no sense of his presence, He's no further away from you than if you do have a sense of his presence. Our sufficiency should not be in ourselves, but it's always in God. And when we're overwhelmed by the evil of what's going on in us and around us, uh, we need to look and see with the eyes of faith and always turn to the true God who never leaves us and never forsakes us. He guards us against visible and invisible dangers every single day. A couple lessons that we can learn from, from just this uh, story of Elisha. The obstacles mean nothing to God. <laughs> you may think, oh man, this is overwhelming, this is too big, I could never ever face this. But it's, uh, that's not true with God. God is always able to handle no matter what you think is unmanageable. We need to stop focusing on the odds and the obstacles and start remembering that our God is greater than all of that. Another good lesson is um, those who are on the Lord's side are never outnumbered. We never are. may not always look that way, but... God is always greater. We're always in the majority. Um, and, and here's the fun lesson. God wins. God wins. God wins every single time in a landslide. <laughs> it's not even close. He blows them away. Elijah said, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And that is true today. You may or may not see it, but you know that servant, he didn't see it. He didn't see it until Elisha prayed and God revealed it. And, and, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. He saw the Syrian army, he saw the obstacles. He just didn't see what God was providing for him, but God was providing for him. It was there whether he saw it or not. And the same thing in your life, you see obstacles and you see odds and you see troubles but God is there. God is providing. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. God has promised that he will be there and that he will not leave you or forsake you. He is indeed the ever-present help in our time of trouble. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for the promise that you have in your word toward us. Thank you that you are indeed always there with us. And today, God, we pray that you would just help us to stand firm in the promises you have. Let us be bold in Christ, not arrogant uh, or even self-serving in any way. But let us just rejoice in who you are and know that you are the victor and that the victory is ours. When we're talking about greater things like eternity, then God, just help us to have your mindset, your heart. And may we honor Jesus Christ in all we do. In his name we pray, amen.